In March of 2012, following several weeks of interactions with individual beekeepers and small groups, more formal two-day training sessions were provided in the villages of Magnori, Marugu, and Larabanga, in the northern region of Ghana, near Mole National Park. Training was conducted by apicultural development technicians, myself, Conrad Berube, Seydou Pasor, Muhammad Ali Ibrahim, and Josh Curry Bascom. With the financial support of Bees for Babar and the U.S. Agency for International Development's Farmer to Farmer program administered by Partners of the Americas. With logistical support from the U.S. Peace Corps and Erocha, Ghana. In the first sessions of the formal training, we covered introduction and safety issues and uh, apiary sighting as well as the basics of Kenya top bar hive design and these topics are discussed in the first part of this video series. Training began with a general discussion of the uses of honey in medicine. When store-bought antibiotics are not available, honey, especially when mixed with salt, applied to a wound will assist in halting the spread of infection. Of course after washing the wound with soap and water and applying the honey and salt mixture the wound should be covered with a bandage or cloth to prevent attracting flies. Prior to our holding the formal apicultural training sessions, mm -hmm. we discussed the medicinal uses of honey and salt when we met with a number of small microfinance groups, from whom we found that a number of women, to save a few pennies, were buying locally produced salt instead of iodized salt. Iodized salt is available in markets in Ghana, and its regular consumption will help to prevent goiter and to prevent the mental retardation that can result when a pregnant woman is not ingesting sufficient iodine to support the requirements of her baby's developing brain and nervous system. Dehydration caused by diarrhea still claims the lives of thousands of infants in rural West Africa. If someone is sick and losing a lot of fluids from vomiting or diarrhea, one can use honey to make a rehydration drink. Start with one and a half liters of clean water, either commercially available mineral water or water that has been boiled and cooled. Or you can also use an herbal tea made from lemongrass, Symbopogon citratus. Add to the water three tablespoons of honey and three-eighths of a teaspoon of salt and three-eighths teaspoon of baking soda. That's the same thing as bicarbonate of soda. If baking soda is unavailable, use another three-eighths teaspoon of salt. That is, use three-quarters of a teaspoon of salt in total. Of course, you don't need to be sick to enjoy this refreshing recipe, and sweetened and salted lemongrass tea makes a very economical and tasty alternative to Gatorade or other expensive sports drinks. A lot of the folks we spoke with seemed quite interested and receptive to this information. Seydou Baba Passer, our new community bee technician and Bees for Baba director in Ghana, made a presentation to the local school children, challenging them to build a Kenya top bar hive from uh, local materials. I offered a not insubstantial monetary reward for the best hive, and several of the youngsters tried their hands at the attempt. Although their hives were a bit small, they were all so impressive that I couldn't make up my mind which was the best. So, I didn't give any of them the money. <laughs> Nah, I'm just kidding. I paid them all. We also asked the boys if they would be willing to present their creations to the adult learners in the community, and they were quite proud to do so. Most of the boys used the balsa wood-like midrib of the raffia palm leaf as their building material. The resulting boxes are somewhat on the delicate side, but their size and lightness would make them excellent swarm boxes, which could be rubbed down with lemongrass and left out to catch passing swarms. Using swarm boxes or empty hives baited with lemongrass and or beeswax is the principal means of acquiring honeybees for most small apiculturalists in West Africa. It is important that swarm boxes or trap hives be cleaned regularly during swarm season to maintain them pest free. Another means of obtaining bees is by transferring a wild nest into a hive. This is about the hairiest task that a beekeeper can undertake and you're not guaranteed 100% success. But it's a great learning experience and confidence builder for new beekeepers. I've talked about hive transfers elsewhere, so I'm only going to briefly cover it here. 
Here you see Seiru in an moment Yakubu making hammocks out of cotton strips to support the cut comb against the top bars. Threader fishing line can be used to tie around the transverse face of the comb to keep it from flopping out of the hammock. Pressed in this way against the wood of the top bars, the bees, over the course of a few days, will repair the comb and attach it there too. If cotton is used for the hammocks and thread, then, after repairing the combs, the bees will often cut these loose themselves, and the debris can be removed during a future hive revision. After all the combs have been tied to top bars, the hive should be placed as close as possible to the original location of the wild nest. Ideally, you would have been able to have located the queen and caged her with a candy plug inside the hive. After two or three days to allow for comb repair, the hive can be moved to an apiary, preferably an hour or two before dawn, when all the bees are at home and they are cool and calm and not flying. The hive shown here was actually empty and was actually empty. Harvesting of highly defensive African bee strains is often done at night, sometimes with heavily padded bee suits that almost amount to body armor. Although such personal protective equipment is almost impervious to bee stings, it's very hot, which can cause apiculturalists to work overly fast and brusquely in the hives, killing many bees during the harvest operation. Apiculturalists so outfitted and trained in this technique do not use smoke to calm the bees. And even though on this particular occasion I did lend them my smoker, the manner in which they banged rather than lightly tapped the top bars in order to locate honey-filled comb, and the brusque way in which they scraped bees off the combs that they were attempting to harvest, rather than brushing them off gently with a brush made out of soft grasses or leaves, so enraged the bees that I was only able to take small snippets of video during the operation, because the angry insects were drawn to the feeble light cast by my camera, and they were stinging the heck out of my hands, since I had lent my gloves to one of the other assistants. Here you can see how a long knife is used to separate the top bars, and how the same tool is used to scrape bees off the comb. I don't recommend that. That, or swiping the bees off the top bars with a gloved hand, will crush quite a few bees, releasing alarm pheromone, which will incite the bees to wreak their vengeance upon any exposed skin, which in this case happened to be mine. Oh well, it was all in the service of determining the status quo of the existing beekeeping techniques. Note again the heavy canvas bee suit worn by this honey harvester in comparison to the light bee jacket worn by Seidu here. Another factor contributing to what I considered the rough manner in which this honey harvest was conducted is that it was done by hired journeymen who did not own the bees, but rather were hired by the hive's owner to pull off the season's honey haul, which encouraged quick work with little regard for maintaining the means of production. In any case, this night's activity resulted in a fairly respectable haul of honey. It was covered over with a cache of leaves from a nearby tree to prevent the bees that were flying around in the dim light of the flashlights from alighting on the honey. And nestled inside there on the left-hand side, you can see a water atomizer. This is basically just a fancy spray bottle that produces a very fine mist of water droplets that can be used in the same way that smoke is. Water droplets will weigh and cool down the bees and make them less likely to fly. However, it is not nearly as effective as smoke is at calming the bees and should only be used as a supplement, not a replacement for smoke. I've already spoken about the proper use of smoke in a couple of other videos, so I'm not going to cover it in great detail here, except to say that after we had demonstrated the effective use of smoke, those we had doused with the fumes were almost too confident, and we had to discourage them from being too close to the hive we were going to revise. And we encouraged the spectators to seek shelter in some nearby vegetation. Nonetheless, a number of the more experienced apiculturalists, who had never seen the inner workings of their hives during the day, chose to attend the revision quite closely, even though they had no more protection than the dousing of smoke we had given them. And while we confined ourselves to light manipulations, we did not insist that they seek greater safety. However, for more intensive activities, such as harvesting, we did insist that everyone have proper personal protective equipment before delving too deep into the hive. I'm happy to report that we conducted a number of both daytime and nighttime training sessions involving heavy hive manipulations, including harvests, without having any serious sting incidents. One of the key practices to prevent sting incidents is to wait a sufficient amount of time for the smoke to take effect yep. after smoking the hive entrance and before opening it up. That's usually about a minute or two. And uh, also to ensure that any nearby colonies, especially those that are facing the area where you'll be working, are also doused down with smoke. 
Here's another key technique for working highly defensive bees. After smoking yourselves, inside and out of your protective equipment, smoke the occupied hive on which you will be working, here marked with a red hexagon, and then gently carry the occupied colony some distance away from its original location into a secluded shady area, preferably out of the direct sight line of the original location. Here in this newsprint poster you can still see the occupied colony in the background. And replace the occupied box with an empty box. Most of the defensive bees leaving the colony during manipulation and the foragers coming back from the field will return to the original hive site rather than stinging the beekeepers. Keep in mind, of course, that although this technique is great for keeping the beekeeper safe, if the original hive location was near where people or animals frequent, then you should probably conduct the manipulation at night. A good compromise is to begin your hive manipulations in early evening, while you can still see what you're doing, but both you and the bees are cooler, which makes the bees less likely to sting and the beekeeper less likely to hurry his movements in an effort to get out of his hot bee suit. Pressing the bees off comb with a bouquet of foliage is much less likely to induce an alarm reaction than scraping them off with the blade of a knife or with one's hand. And while the bees are calm, you can work without gloves if, as Latif and Sadu demonstrate here, you occasionally mask the odor of your skin with smoke. A couple of other things to note here. In contrast to Latif, who you can see there on the left, generally one wears one's hat inside one's veil in order to keep the veil material away from one's face in case things go sideways and bees start to sting. Also, you can see what are a relatively few number of bees for, for Africans, which tend to be very runny, on the outside of the hive. You don't want to use so much smoke that you drive the entire colony outside of the box, otherwise they may abscond. That's another advantage of working later in the day as the light vanishes and prevents the bees from flying. It gives them a chance to calm down after the disturbance of the manipulation, revision, harvest, whatever, and to resume their normal behavior patterns. You may also have noticed that this hive has been hung in order to protect the hive from bushfires and incursion from ants. Honey production is by far the predominant management objective for Ghanaian beekeepers, whether that production be for home consumption or for sale. The methods employed for harvesting are crucial to the quality of the product and are a major point of consideration for beginning honey producers. It is important to use local materials and techniques appropriate to local client groups to harvest and process honey. Traditional harvesting methods are discussed in part one of this series, so here I'll only go over improved techniques. Here, Muhammad Ali Ibrahim leads a session demonstrating the use of an improved filtering rig appropriate to local conditions. Only pure honeycomb should be extracted. Combs containing brood and or pollen are best left in the hive. It is crucial that anything that may come into contact with the honey, buckets, screens, cloth, bottles, should be clean enough to eat from. Anyone working with the honey should ensure that their hands are thoroughly washed before beginning this process. In West Africa, women, who are generally more familiar with and diligent about kitchen hygiene, may be more accustomed to taking such care. Once harvested, the comb should be broken up or crushed and allowed to drain into a clean bucket, through plastic or fiber baskets, clean mosquito netting, or other screening material of similar gauge. Clean bicycle tubing can be used to secure the screen to the bucket. This process should be completed overnight when bees are not flying or the whole affair can be sealed within a large polyethylene bag or a covered plastic bin and left in the sun to hasten draining. This will prevent the attraction of bees which will steal considerable amounts of honey when sloppy extraction or storage is employed. Once the primary screening has occurred, the honey should be further filtered through a clean headscarf, muslin, cheesecloth, or through a cloth water filter of the type commonly distributed in Ghana by rural health workers for the control of guinea worm. After this final filtering, the honey will be almost entirely free of the small bits of wax, bee body parts, and pollen, and will be ready for bottling. As you can see on the left, the honey that's produced from Kenya top bar hives is considerably cleaner, clearer, and more attractive than the traditionally produced honey on the right. Lino blocks can be used to make stamp labels or Colorful printed labels can be produced at the district capital. Labels should contain a spot for the weight, price, and contact information for the producer. On this trip, I designed a couple of custom labels for the honey produced in the Magnori area. The wax that remains after squeezing out comb can be cleaned and processed 
to create a number of value-added products. Here, training participants in Larabanga are cleaning some of the squeezed-out comb with drinking water. The rinse water can then be filtered to make sweetened drinks for immediate consumption, or in some parts of West Africa, such water is left to ferment to make a mead-like honey beer. The rinsed wax bits can then be thrown into hot water and heated just to their melting point, and then the water and wax mixture is poured through a cloth sack, something like a pillowcase works great, which is then squeezed to remove any impurities from the wax which stay behind in the bag. The water and wax mixture is then allowed to cool, and the wax cap that forms on top can then be removed, and any pollen that is accumulated on the bottom of the wax block can be scraped off. Beeswax can, of course, be used to make a number of value-added products, such as candles, batik dyed fabric, and cosmetics. I've covered these topics in other videos, probably most thoroughly in one called Beekeeping in Guinea Wax Product, a link for which you can find by searching for that title on YouTube or by going to the Bee Stuff webpage on the beesforbalar.org website. For more information, search YouTube or Google for 2012 Bees for Babar Progress Report or visit beesforbabar.org. Thanks for watching.